hello. And welcome once again to a Beatles program called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly talk show in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Fab Four. Could be anything about their past. We could be reviewing an album of theirs, a song of theirs, any of their music, anything going on today, and possibly the future as well. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. You might know me for my other Beatles program, a syndicated show called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my other two regular co-hosts. First of all, we have one of the contributing writers for Billboard magazine, also Access, A-X-S dot com, for Variety, for Goldmine, and probably another (laughs) ten publications that I haven't remembered. (laughs) (laughs) I'm oh, sure well. Steve will fill us in, but yeah. Steve Maraducci, hi, welcome to Things We Said Today. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also, our other co-host, and that being our resident musicologist, who is the author of the recent ebook, Got That Something, How I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and also the author of From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and that is our very own Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. On uh, today's show, it's actually part two of our Sgt. Pepper special. On our last show, we reviewed the audio portion of the brand new Sgt. Pepper deluxe box set. We talked about the new stereo mix that uh, Giles Martin and Sam O'Kell put together. And also we talked about uh, the outtakes that you can hear on uh, two of the discs in the deluxe box set. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about the rest of the box set, primarily uh, the book that comes with it and also the DVD. Before we do that, I just want to mention a couple of things. First of all, I want to remind everybody that there is a Sgt. Pepper special that will air on PBS on June the 3rd, uh, which is this coming Saturday. And it's called Sgt. Pepper, The Beatles Revolution. And it's being hosted by Howard Goodall. And um, I believe it is going to air at 8 p.m. in your time zone. I can't be certain about that, but I know where I live in Connecticut, it will be airing at 8 p.m. Well, on, and uh, let me let me just interject uh, from my days working TV schedules with my former newspaper. PBS outlets have their own option to air shows whenever they want to. So while right. while 8 o'clock may be where it is with you, it may not be 8 o'clock everywhere. So you need to – people should check their, their local listings, as they say. Right. Okay. So, again, that's this Saturday, the uh, PBS special on Sgt. Pepper. Um, also, I just wanted to mention very quickly uh, that last night I went to see a concert with the legendary David Crosby. And it was a wonderful show. And he was in – amazing voice he's got great musicians in his band including his own son james with whom he's written a lot of songs with but the reason i wanted to bring up the david crosby uh concert is because he performed a song that he wrote about george harrison and i'm not really sure if when david first released this song he let it be known that it was about george i know that steve you wrote an article about this not long ago but um back uh when david released his album if i could only remember my name he had a song on there called laughing which was about george harrison and he told this story of how when the birds started out obviously they were huge beatle fans and their manager booked the birds to do a tour of the uk and david was petrified that he would have to beat the beatles (laughs) you know he was a major fan and all and according to david uh the manager booked the band in the worst possible clubs, dingy clubs, stinky clubs. He <laughs> hated all of it. And at the third concert that they gave there, he looked out into the audience, and there sitting in the audience was John Lennon. So, <laughs> and sitting next to John was Mick Jagger. So you can imagine, you know, the, the birds are in awe of the Beatles, not to mention, I'm sure, the Stones. But uh, right there in the audience was, was John and Mick. And um, they got along great. John understood what the birds were doing. But he also went on to say that of all the Beatles, he was most impressed with George Harrison. Because even early on, he seemed to be on another plane on his spiritual quest. Hmm. And um, he said that he had heard George saying to him that he was going to go to India 
and uh, study with the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and George was really praising the Maharishi and just saying, you know, this is the man who has all the answers. And David was really a bit of a cynic, and he wanted to say to George, look, you know, just be careful. You know, it's very easy to be misled. You know, he didn't believe in such a thing that there could be one person who has all the answers of the universe like that. And he wanted to tell George that. But he couldn't work up the nerve to do that because this is George Harrison we're talking about. So um, he wrote this song about it, and it was a really beautiful song, and you can find it on that album. Really pretty, and harmonies are wonderful. You know, it had a lot to do with George and his spiritual quest. So, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you want to check out that song, again, it's called Laughing from David Crosby. But... um, I'm not sure if that story ever came out until recently. Hmm. So, um, also, I just wanted to mention very quickly, since we're talking about Sergeant Pepper here, through one of our very own listeners, uh, David Rosenia, I hope I'm pronouncing his last name right, we were talking about the comment that Elliot Easton of the Cars made about, you know, he's not thrilled about the remixes of, of uh, you know, all the Beatle releases in recent years in general, and... Um, so David pointed out to me that Jeff Emmerich, who of course is one of the engineers on Charge and Pepper, gave an interview to ABC uh, in Australia. And you can find that interview on YouTube. It's a little more than half hour long. And, you know, there's a lot of fascinating things that he talks about. The relationship that he had with the Beatles, what was it like working with John versus Paul, all of that, and all the different recording techniques of what he did in the studio. But towards the end of the interview, he did say that he himself is disgusted. He used the word disgusted with the reissues of the Beatles. So it's not like Elliot Easton is alone in this, in this category. But what he did say was that he thinks that when these reissues, these, these remixes come out, it's more about making technical changes. And the artistic decisions that were made many years ago could be ignored when you're doing that. There are certain things that you may not hear that you heard on the original mixes. And that was the argument that he had to make. There might be certain textures that are missing. And certainly someone like Jeff would hear that. Hmm. So I just wanted to get a a quick response from the two of you. I mean, like, hey, listen, this is Jeff Emmerich talking. The guy worked on the album. Yeah. You know, yeah, the textures are going to be different, and one of the reasons the textures are going to be different is because they're going back to the first-generation tapes, which they didn't have available to work with in 1967. So that's going to be a textural difference, and I think it's actually probably for the better. I mean, you could argue that, okay, in making Sgt. Pepper, the Beatles were listening to those bounced-down reduction mixes and that's what they had in their headphones when they were adding new lines and that's you know the, what they were m- making the mixes with but yeah you could argue that i mean if you wanted to make a new mix that sounded precisely absolutely precisely exactly like the old mix why would you bother right you know um so only I mean, if it's cleaner only if it's cleaner and then well, yeah, but you see, it's, it, it being cleaner is something that bothers some people, too. They may not know that it bothers them that because it's cleaner. It bothers them because it sounds different. Mm-hmm. Um, and in terms of, you know, the artistic decisions, I mean, I kind of – I understand what he's saying, um, except that they're using – the 67 mono mix is a template, so they're listening really closely to, okay, this this goes this way on the 67 mix, let's do that. Um, and they did, like we talked about last week, some things differently, that last chord in a day in the life is louder, the little sitar bit in Within You, Without You, and, and things like that. But I, I'm not sure there's very much missing. I haven't really missed anything that I heard in on the 67 mix but don't hear on the new one, apart from things like stereo panning and that kind of stuff. And if you're going to argue that, well, you know, we did the stereo panning and we missed that, then, you know, they're arguing against the argument that I don't really believe in in the first place, which is that they didn't spend any time on the stereo mix and didn't care about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, those were... I, I, 
I think, you know, I think, uh, was it Giles Martin? Someone said, basically, look, a mix is a performance. I think it might have been Giles. It might have even been in your interview, Steve. No? No, it wasn't in mine. Okay. In mine. He said a mix is a performance, and, and that's exactly right, you know, and you're going to perform a little differently on one day than on the next day. That's one of the reasons we have right. differences in the stereo and mono mixes, and here it is 50 years later with different people. So, yeah, it's going to be different, but, mm. you know, I mean, disgusted well, is pretty strong. You know? Right. That, well, that was the word he used. Yeah, I know. My, you know, my feeling, and I think this is getting lost in a lot of the comments I've seen on Facebook, and I've and I've said this a couple uh, a couple of times to people, that this is not the official mix. They've never, you know, from the very beginning, there's been no semblance that this is replacing the 2009 mix, which is the official mix. This is, as you say, Alan, it's a performance. Is what it is, and there are. I mean, I've heard of. I've heard, you know, people say. Uh, I think it's been day in the life when they there's things that they can't he, that they're missing. I forget exactly what. I'm really not paying attention to that. I'm just kind of listening to the music and listening to what I can hear. And and but yeah, this is not replacing anything. It's not repl- It's not the official mix. And and they're not taking the other the 2009 CDs. Out of print. I mean, that's those are the those are, for all intents and purposes, the gold standard as far as the Beatles are concerned. Mm-hmm. I, I think I, you know. I, I mean, real. I realize when you go to what they do, what they've done, and go back to the original tapes and all that, you know, you're you've got you know something different, but it's not replacing the original album. It's not replacing right. the the remasters. Yeah, um, and even the mono. CDs are not a new mix. It's a new transfer, but it's not a new mix. So, I mean, they didn't filter. They didn't do any filtering, as far as I know. I mean, I looked because somebody had asked me about the mono mix too, whether that was different. Mm-hmm. And I had to look at. I had to look at the materials that I got from the label, and it said it's just a 2017 transfer of the 2009 mono mix. So, no, no, you know, 1967 mono mix. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I mean, it's the it's the rema- Well, it's the it's the now you're now you're confusing me here because I read it as they didn't remix in 2009. They just transferred. Okay. So this may okay. be a new transfer of the same mono tape that they transferred right. in 2009. That's, exa- that's exactly yeah. what it is. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what it is. So you know, that's where that's where we stand with this, and and I think people need to keep that you know as hard. You know, as glorious and as big an accomplishment and as big an achievement as this is, you know, that needs to be remembered. And it's I admit it's probably kind of hard with all the stuff that's come out and everything and the way this thing has been received and the excitement. I mean, I couldn't believe the the con- some of the comments that came out with the day it came out. You know, it's mm-hmm. like. Everybody was freaking out, and uh, you know, I had people, friends of mine, going, "I got it! I got it!" You know, thank yeah. God for Amazon Prime. Thank yeah. God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, it's nice to be excited about something, you know. It's you know, there are a lot of people who don't like it uh, as well, and and they're you know now beginning to turn up because everyone's you know got it, spent some time with it. I think some people are disappointed by certain aspects of it. Um, I think there are a number of people who agreed with my comment about how the vocal sound has lost some of its suppleness um, because it's apparently been compressed. You know, one of the things that people do, CDs that come out and and it sounds uh, what Doug Sulpey calls loudified to them is they they put mm-hmm. the, they put the waveform on the screen and see whether it's brick walled which is basically clipped in other words so you've got a you know a, what looks like a big solid blue wall of of sound instead of you know waves that go up and down um, mm-hmm. and on this one you don't see that because what they've done is they've compressed individual tracks like the vocals or, you know, and, and so each track has its own level of compression in a different way. And it doesn't 
really none of them bother me except the vocal sound and only on some of the tracks like she's leaving home mm-hmm. um but other people find it too loud and aggressive and uh you know they 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 feel assaulted by the album and and I can understand that too I mean I had some some thoughts about that when I first heard it but what I kind of felt and this is where you know presumably Jeff Emmerich would give me an argument is that part of the difference is that I'm used to hearing an LP or a CD, which is very mixed down, very produced, whatever. And then I, I think that maybe what we're hearing now is more like what we would hear if we were sitting in the studio listening to the tapes, mm-hmm. you know, mm. without, without the intermediaries of, of pressing technology and all that stuff. And, um, you know, and and so it sounds aggressive to us, but it it may have sound may have sounded aggressive when they were playing it in the studio. Yeah, very good points. You know, I, I've I've said it many times that um, with Beatles fans, you will never please everybody, no right. matter how hard you try. And you've got purists out there who don't want any change whatsoever, and then you want people like us who would like to hear different versions of all the Beatles albums and all the different outtakes, you know, it's, it's impossible to please everyone. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's just yeah. a reality. That's, yeah. that's part of the territory. Yeah. You know, one person, one person I have known for several years complained about the price of the, of the deluxe set. He thought it was way overpriced. I'd have a little bit of a, um, of a, you know, of an argument with that because I don't, uh, considering, how much, you know, the bootlegs are, are, which, I mean, obviously anybody who has dealt with bootlegs knows some of these tracks, um, knows that those can get pretty expensive. And the price actually dropped down quite a bit. But it's up know. again. Yeah, I saw that it's up again. And but it, Amazon it, had dropped down to 117 and now they're back up to 149 Right. Wow. Yeah. Right. So That's very surprising to me. Nah, not really. I think there. I think the it, supply and demand before the release, and now that it's it's you know the it's out there, the release is you know it's they can they figure they can make some money off of it, which mm-hmm. is too which is too bad. Should have bought all those birthday presents in the first place. You know? There we go. <laughs> there, there we go. There we go. But anyway. So I thought that since you actually brought this up just now, Steve, I thought we'd talk about just the mono CD that comes in the box set. And I wanted to know, I mean, yes, you said it's a transfer of the 2009 mono CDs. We also had the mono LPs three years ago. Is there any sonic upgrade when you listen to the new mono compared to the 2009? How do you feel about that, Alan? It sounded about the same to me. I, I didn't spend an awful lot of time comparing it because I just – I wasn't looking for an upgrade. I, I was just, okay, that's the mono and it's got the extra stuff at the end of the disc. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, the the little bit of comparison I did, it, it sounded pretty similar. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, didn't, I also didn't spend a whole lot of time with it either. But, yeah, it didn't seem sonically – it didn't seem, uh, I guess – Enticing, I guess, is that the word? Um, it didn't. There didn't seem to be any uh, charge like there was with the with the stereo mix, you know, because that was obviously very different. Where this did not seem to be different. It, I'm, you know, I'm glad they threw all that stuff in at the end, as you know, as we said last week. But no, I don't think there was. It didn't seem to be different. Yeah, I know that there's a few people that I've spoken to, some fans, that feel that there wasn't really a need to include the mono CD. Or, alternatively, if they were going to include the mono CD, they might as well have also included the stereo. Mm. You know, since, mm. you're, yeah. since you're not That's going a- to have the, the run-out groove necessarily, which they don't in the mono one, um, you could actually, I think, still fit the mono and stereo on one CD. They, they could have done that as an archival thing um, and moved some of the extras from the end of the mono CD onto discs two and three. And, mm-hmm. that, would have, and that probably would have eliminated some of the confusion about whether the new mix... Than is the official mix, which it is not. So, right, but but right, yeah. But how did you guys feel about the bonus tracks on the mono CD? 
My only real disappointment was in the promo for Penny Lane. Penny, of course, really, yeah. Everybody. It, it's out of, yeah, it's got all this surface noise on it. You couldn't have found a cleaner copy. <laughs> really? Yeah. That, yeah, that was a little disappointing. Yeah. I could go to my Beatles Rarities album on vinyl. It'll sound better than that. Really. Yeah, but that's not really the promo. That's only the, a stereo mix with the trumpet tacked on the end. Mm-hmm. So you could okay. argue, you could argue that they could easily have just taken a standard mono mix from the master tape, added the trumpet back in, and probably nobody would have known the difference. At least they were honest about it and gave us <laughs> an actual transfer of that of that mix. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, someone out there, and at this point, you know, we keep hearing about how they're paying attention to fans. They look at the internet, they listen to podcasts and all that. Someone out there must have a clean copy that they could have loaned them. But uh, I mean, I don't find it unlistenable or anything. It's just, no. you know, it's just not quite up to the rest. Mm. Mm-hmm. Any of those bonus tracks you find really interesting? Mm, I think, well, you know, we've already had Take One of a Day in the Life, the, or the, the early mix of a day in the life. Um, we first had on an acetate, you know, from on a bootleg, um, mm. and then it was cleaned up. And it, it's, it's, it appears, I believe, on Anthology, but this is a bit longer, has more before and after, and is a bit cleaner. The other mixes, the, you know, Lucy in the Sky, uh, I didn't find anything that spectacularly new about that, but maybe I missed something. And and She's Leaving Home, I kind of liked just because it still had the cello parts. I I, I understand why they cut the cello parts. I, I think it was a good idea to cut the cello parts, but it's interesting to hear a mix that still has them in. Mm-hmm. So, hmm. Okay. When it comes to the DVD and Blu-ray, they also had the song Some Sgt. Pepper on there, Mm -hmm. and those were in 5.1. And in stereo, too. Stereo Mm -hmm. and stereo high res. So if you're really a a sound quality freak, um, the high res files on the Blu-ray and DVD are actually better quality than on the CD. (laughs) But Mm. I say that theoretically because, you know, I don't... I don't hear it, you know. But, uh, <laughs> oh, we just know that these are high res files, and then you know, by definition, <laughs> they're going to be better. But um, I, I haven't actually even spent any time comparing them. Um, I spent more time comparing the LP to the CD. And I think the LP mm-hmm. sounds better. Steve didn't, right? Are you talking about the the LP or the the DVD? Because well, I I did listen to the DVD a little bit, and I. The stereo yeah, mixes too. Yeah, I didn't find the mixes that. Th- I, I, I'll tell you, the mixes, the the ones I did find really, really thrilling were the Pet Sounds in the Pet Sounds set. Those were tremendous. These didn't seem as as um, spectacular to me. But are I you talking know. about the five point one or the high res yeah. stereo? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But well, which but one? Actually, close the the high res stereo. I didn't find the high res stereo all that all that great. I did hear people say that they thought the five one mixes were were really good. So yeah, but you know, Alan, you, Alan, you said you haven't heard the five point one. I mix? have. Yeah, I, I just didn't spend time with the high res stereo because they're basically the same thing. And you mm-hmm. know, for for some theoretical sound improvement, I I just didn't really spend much time with them but i did listen to the 5.1 and i listened to the 5.1 in uh i had a friend of mine sort of ripped the tracks out of the 5.1 so you can <laughs> listen to them separately which you know which you can't do like you know like when you you're a kid with a um, stereo system you got a balance control you can go left right you want to hear just the left fine you want to hear just the right fine you can't do that with they don't you don't get like a five-way switch like that on 5.1 so if you want to listen to things separately Separately, you actually have to rip the disc, and I mean, unless you're going to somehow disconnect all your speakers <laughs> except the one you're mm-hmm. listening. To. Um, the easiest way is just to rip it. And uh, so this friend of mine did, you know, front stare, front two channels, back two channels, and mm-hmm. the center channel. 
Um, and then there's also a, there's someone also has done each individual channel. I mean, those oh, are those are those are fun if you want to do your own remixes. Uh, but you know, for listening to what's going on. I mean, I, I listen to the surround mix as a surround mix first. The thing about surround mixes, and I think we talked about this when One Plus came out. You know, there are surround mixes and there are surround mixes. You've got Pink Floyd, you might have things flying around the room, you know. Right. Uh, the, with the Beatles ones, uh, Giles Martin takes, it seems, almost as a matter of policy, uh, a more conservative approach. He just wants to put you sort of in the middle of the band. He doesn't want any craziness going on around you. Now, I think... If there's any album of the Beatles where you do want craziness going on around you, this is the one. So yeah. if we didn't get it on this, I don't think we're going to get it on any of the 5.1 mixes. I can't see him going nuts with Rubber Soul, you know, maybe Revolver. But, you know, I mean, I think he could have done more with the sound effects on Mr. Kite, for instance, you know, yeah. and, and, and certain other things. Good morning, good morning. Right. Exactly. You know, those things, you know, they, they, they could be swirling around the room to some degree. There were some really nice, you know, listening to the, the separated uh, tracks, some of them were really nice. I mean, when I'm 64, the rear two channels are just instrumental. And it's a really lovely instrumental mix. I mean, it's not everything. Some things are in the front. And so you listen to that, and it's, it's, it's quite nice. But I found the general effects of the surround sound as a surround sound mix kind of nice. I mean, you're sitting in the middle of the room, you've got instruments coming out from behind you and in front of you. It's just that they don't move a lot and that's okay. You know, it's, it's a certain kind of approach to surround mix. That's basically like a, an overgrown stereo mix in a way. Mm -hmm. huh. Gee, I would think with a song like a day in the life, you could do so much. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially the the orchestral buildup, you can you can have a swirling effect yep. in the room if you want to. You could, and that could add a lot, you know, to the experience of hearing it. So that's right. And especially hmm. since they had all those unmixed tapes, you know, what George Martin did is as a way around um, hiring the full orchestra and dealing with the union rules, he had recorded them several times and then used the several performances in his mix so that it sounds like a bigger orchestra than it is. It's only like 40 some odd instruments and it sounds right. like a full symphony orchestra. Well, okay. You've got the buildup going a couple of times on those master tapes. You could do a lot with that on a surround sound mix. Mm. And, and like but, I say, but the, Giles the, didn't. No. And like with Benefit of Mr. Kite, you've got the, you know, the calliope kind of thing and the, the, the steam right. organ that was cut up into pieces. That thing could be going all over the place, too. And, and that almost kind of calls for it, you know. But maybe they're taking the Neil Aspinall approach of, you know, anything that seems logical is just too obvious. And so we're not going to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So. I could hear also Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, the organ part. Oh, yeah. You could mm -hmm. have the notes bouncing around in different speakers. Mm -hmm. That would be kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot huh. you could do, a lot more they could have done. But I, I found it enjoyable. All right. Well, why don't we move on to the DVD then? Okay. The DVD has the documentary of the making of Sgt. Pepper, which mm -hmm. uh, premiered on the 25th anniversary of Sgt. Pepper, and it also has the videos yep. for Penny Lane, Strawberry Fields Forever, and A Day in the Life. And I can tell you, at least those three videos are probably the cleanest I've ever seen them. And, uh, you know, A Day in the Life is like breathtaking. They all are, really, especially the colors, the different colors that you see in all those three videos, and Strawberry Fields especially. Oh, I, I was really impressed with the three videos. Let's let's um, more let's than talk about the more than first. the one plus. A little bit, hmm. just a little bit. You know, do you think if they were they were kind of equal? I thought they were pretty similar. Yeah, and in oh. fact, I just assumed that they just used the same transfer since it was only two years ago. Yeah, I, I didn't spend much time with them, but that, that was my assumption too. So, but uh, it's great yeah. having them there. Obviously, they belong on this set, you know, and it, it's. If you're, you're talking about a really, for all practical purposes, a five-disc set because the six, five and six are 
repeats of each other in, in different formats right. to have three things you know that we've had only two years ago i don't think anybody's really going to be that concerned about that i mean thematically I, they belong here and yeah yeah it's too bad they didn't throw the uh tomorrow never knows within you without you love video on there but um, why would that belong here because it's within Elk you, is without, within you. without you. Yeah, right. I guess you could. Say and that. and and let me ask another question that occurred to me as we were sitting here talking. Should they have put together a video for a song? I don't know which, but a song, brand new. Should they have done a new video? Hmm. Well, they've done that a lot for their right. recent projects. So right. Yeah, and they didn't do it for this one. <laughs> hey, they could have given us the video of. From you know the Sgt. Pepper from Rock Band, enough people have bootlegged that. That's true. And there's <laughs> another. There's actually another. The whole album, album. The whole album, you know, is available right. as Rock Band videos. So right. Um, they didn't give us those mixes. That's true. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm, folks. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Honest. You know, I mean, it would have been. It, it there's something that they could have done. Is they could have. Put a new video together, and uh, or even something to go with, maybe to throw in from love, you know, with footage from love or whatever. I mean, you know, there's all all sorts of things you could come up with, just kind of sitting, you know, playing armchair quarterback. There is and, a, there uh, is a real project for a desktop bootlegger here. I mean, we've already added just in our conversation tonight the stereo mix, the '67 stereo mix, the mm -hmm. rock band videos with the rock band mixes. Um, that's so okay. two discs. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> then you people could, get to get to work and send you, them to us. <laughs> you could you could also take all of the Pepper related tracks from anthology. And uh, mm -hmm. and put them in, and there were some anthology videos that were a bit different from the finished videos. They could um, take those without the little bits of talk over at beginning and end. Yeah, there's, there's definitely another maybe two or three or or even more discs worth of stuff. And and what you see a mm -hmm. lot is with desktop bootleggers, you know, people who just do this for the love of it, is is they take all the sources and bring them together. And I think that the uh, you know the official release of discs two and three of uh, on this Pepper set is kind of going to be enough of an excuse for people to sort of revisit the previous ones that have been done, like by Purple mm -hmm. Chick and other other labels, and and fill it out further. Mm -hmm. Right, that could be fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the documentary on the making of Sgt. Pepper. Mm. I hadn't seen it for quite a while, but when I watched it, I felt like I just saw it, I don't know, a couple of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's just so memorable. I guess right. so much of what was said there kind of stood out for me. Mm -hmm. And and, and the, the fun part, there's a lot that I love about the documentary, but just watching George Martin at the at the mixing board, isolating tracks and hearing, you know, Backward symbols from Ringo, you know, yeah. something like that. It's so cool, even if it's for just a few seconds. Yeah. And that was the first time any of us had really been exposed to that. So, right. um, you know, that's probably the thing that I, I like the most. But there's a lot of great quotes from mm -hmm. uh, from the Beatles on there. And the um, quality is spectacular. Right, right. Mm. Well, I'm the, the thing that really gets to me, you know, I was sitting watching it just before we started. And... I had not seen it. I hadn't really watched it since I got the set. But that special, it's only 49 minutes long. That is a freaking masterpiece. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is so good. I mean, we've all seen Beatles specials since. But the quality of the comments from especially from Paul and Ringo who kind of, you know, be kind of not really focused in completely sometimes, you know, uh, but Ringo is right on the, right on the money. Mm -hmm. And and so is Paul. And, and of course, George, uh, I, uh, that footage, I, I, I didn't realize it, I guess was used in the anthology that, you know, the George, some of that George footage and some of those comments where he talks about the, the people in India going Beatles, Beatles. And, and, you uh -huh. know, but yeah, I mean, that is such a great special. There's no, excess there i mean there's nothing that you know no, you know stuff that's i mean it's all very sharp and and that special is just it, it's got to be one of the best 
rock and roll specials ever and one of the best Beatles specials ever. And I remember watching that on the Disney Channel because that's where it premiered. Tell me if you guys remember. Do you remember Ringo saying? I think he he uses uh, he cusses in that. Uh, and I don't. Really the Disney remember. special was completely bowlerized. They took away a lot of the drug references. The, it, it actually premiered in Britain, and there were bootleg copies that came over almost immediately. And by the time it was shown on Disney, a lot of people had seen the British one and were just okay. aghast at what Disney had done to it. It just okay. was, was awful. Okay, because when I heard when I heard that comment from Ringo, I I was going. I don't remember that on the Disney Channel. <laughs> and, no, and, no. Uh, it does say on the you know on the press release it's unreleased. I don't know that it's unreleased, but it's certainly you know uh, I mean it's not unreleased because it isn't much longer than it would have been yeah. originally. But yeah, the, it's, it's a little it's different a, too. You know, one of the things they did that I, I at least it seemed to me that I thought was kind of nice is that in the original special. You know, George Martin is talking about stuff and he sort of, you know, fades it in. And what you're getting is the sound in the room of the speakers mm-hmm. with George Martin playing it. And I think they've replaced um, that with the actual in line studio track sound. So um, it was done mm-hmm. subtly so that if, if George Martin is, is talking, you still hear him talking. But the sound quality now is much better because, you know, a, a lot of the. Um, things that he played in that special ended up on bootlegs and they were offline recordings as opposed to in right um hmm. and now and now it sounds really really good so uh, you know i, I I'm, I'm glad you know i'm glad you mentioned that i i hadn't you know i was listening to it and then i was listening to the sound and i was going god that sounds really good and it hadn't occurred hmm. to me that they had that they had played with the, with that sound that's hmm. interesting yeah, it's good that you picked that up, Alan. Mm-hmm. I wanted to mention a few quotes here that I thought were really interesting. Mm-hmm. Ringo had said the psychedelic period was the most exciting for him. Mm. You know, you consider all the great music the Beatles did. Who's to say, I don't know, Revolver could have been his favorite moment there, or uh, and there's psychedelic music there, obviously. But maybe the early period was exciting in its own way, or towards the end, whatever. But... Um, I found that particular quote to be, you know, kind of interesting. And also the fact that the way that they were recording back then was so different that they would work on a certain song and then go back to it two weeks later and then Ringo would have to do his drum part. Mm -hmm. So we'd have to go, you know, picture yourself as a musician. You have to go back into the mood of a song (laughs) that you haven't worked on for a while. So that's very different in and of itself than the way the Beatles used to do everything, which was very quickly work on a song and in some cases get songs done in a day or two right Mm -hmm. so i thought that was pretty interesting phil collins defending ringo in the uh in the special that a lot of his fills are very complex and then a lot of drummers can't really duplicate what he does Mm -hmm. i love the fact that that was in there and one of the things that i completely forgot about which i found fascinating when i first watched this show many years ago was when paul brought up the um that harmonica group (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that uh, that was that they were playing harmonicas, and this was a group that Paul had listened to and remembered the way in Pet Sounds there were so many unique sounds, and I guess there were a lot of like bass harmonicas or harmonica sounds. Right. Mm-hmm. So they used that. They took that and they used that idea in being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's so many there's so many instances where you can talk about how Pet Sounds was an influence. I know how, how Paul has said that where Brian would play a place uh, a bass note, it wouldn't always be the root of the chord, and that would add a different dimension right. to a song, something like that. I remember Paul talking about that, and also probably the, the different chord changes and progressions were very different in Pet Sounds, but you know the sounds that came out of Pet Sounds, all the different instrumentation was something that was a very big influence on Sgt. Pepper. Yeah. <laughs> and they just citing the harmonicas. You wouldn't think that if you're listening to being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, but if you listen really carefully, you can hear it. Yep. And you may not think it's a harmonica. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's mm-hmm. it's really cool when they brought that up in the special. It would have been really nice swirling around the room. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> so yeah, I, I I thought the special was you know for for a special that was less than an hour long, it was really full of info. 
And mm. it really belongs <laughs> in this set. You know, it's nice having a video with that kind of explanatory stuff, even though we saw it in 92, you know, and the Day in the Life Penny Lane Strawberry Fields videos. It's, you know, it's a nice touch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's this one quote from George Martin that, uh, well, he said it several times in his lifetime, which kind of bothered me when he when he said, um, when I first met the Beatles, they really couldn't write a decent song. Yeah, really. <laughs> that Love Me Do was the best they could come up with. Now, I happen to like Love Me Do, but, you know, it is a very simple song and it works as a simple song. But ask me why. <laughs> and please, <laughs> please me. Time period, they yeah, already had I mean, Please well, Please Me by the time they did Love Me Do. I mean, they did a demo with that. They did it with Alan w- Andy White the first time. So, you know, I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know why he says these things or said these things. I have a tape of George Martin saying that the first time that he realized that George Harrison wrote a really great song was when he wrote uh, Here Comes the Sun. Hmm. Hmm. That's fairly late, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. I mean, what's wrong with Tagman? What's wrong with Why My Guitar Gently Weeps? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, to name a couple. Jeez, I, I think they were pretty darn good mm-hmm. within you, without you. I mean, yeah. it's a masterpiece. Okay, own up, guys. When, when you were, Okay, Ken, maybe you were too young. But Steve, when that album <laughs> first came out, did you skip within you, without you when you played it? God, I don't, re- you know, I don't remember. Yeah, we always used to skip it. <laughs> you know, we just really didn't like it. And now I think it's one of the – it's just an incredible track. Mm-hmm. You know. But I hey, think when so. You're, when you're 12, it's, you know. <laughs> well, I, I do remember I do remember separating it out and, and you know, and listening to the, the laugh track at the end and, you know, yeah. and, and taking – and and I guess back – when I was, and I'm trying to remember how old I was when it came out, see, 67, I would have been 15, I guess, or something like that. You know, the laugh track made you kind of look at it differently. Yeah. And and, and I wonder, you know, obviously that was George's idea. I mean, that's an interesting thing to do, you know, kind of. Yeah. Self-deprecating in a way. Yeah. Right. It's very self-deprecating. But, um, yeah, it... Uh, I, I don't remember. I I might have. I might very well have, but I don't remember doing it. I I really don't. Yeah, I mean not but every do, time, but you know it's. Yeah, it's, but I do remember. I do remember not thinking of it as good as the rest of the album. I, you know, I it was just it was that strange track. Yeah, that's what you no, know, it was. That's what it was. Well, you know, uh, it's fine for us to recognize the brilliance of that song now, yeah. but I I have an article. I think it's available on my website because I'm collecting all the Sgt. Pepper articles that I'm seeing on the internet. And there's one article rating Sgt. Pepper songs from best to worst. Yeah. And yeah. Within You Without You is considered the worst. 50 years later already, there are so many people who just don't get it. Well, but Ken, you something know? has to be the worst if you're going to rate all the songs. You know, it just. Uh, that's such a that's such a stupid thing to do. I, like, I, I hate know. That. Like, I which hate are, that. which of the Beethoven symphonies is the worst? You know. I mean. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> God. I, I mean, that's for people who really have no don't get it. I, I suppose you know. Um, if no, you have now, to just, now, Steve, people who don't get it write articles saying that Sergeant Pepper turned rock music into men's music. Because until then, apparently, oh, it was okay. girls' music. Go ahead, go ahead and talk. Go ahead and talk about that. No, one. I don't think we need to. But I mean, there's a, no. Know, well, I mean, need quite to quite obviously, a, a clueless, historically clueless article by someone who clearly wasn't alive at the time and didn't quite understand that rock music was for everybody all along, um, mm-hmm. and that you know, seemingly, we all hallucinated. Everything before Sgt. Pepper, like Chuck Berry and Buddy Holly and um, Dylan, the Stones, all all those other things, um, because we all thought that they were for everybody. And but now we're told that actually everything until Sgt. Pepper was mainly for little girls, and Sgt. Pepper transformed rock into music for men. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Hey, you know, 
And at the end, she says, uh, you know, it, it, she resents Sergeant Pepper because, uh, you know, it's it allows people to look back at other kinds of music um, condescendingly if it was written and recorded for people who look like her. And I, I don't think that it's about looking like her. I think I think people <laughs> condescend to people like her if they think like her, analyze her like her, and write articles with no sense of what the hell's going on. That's what people condescend to. <laughs> just saying. Just look. I just looking at the, um, you know, at the list of so many, uh, 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 you know, our Sergeant Pepper fifty articles. Some of the things that got pulled out are just crazy. Yeah. You know. I mean, but that's the way it usually is anyway. With you know. It is. With trying to with trying to make a distinctive piece. To get some attention as you pull out, and and that's one of them. What you were referring to there, I mean, it's just. Yeah, I'll dumb. tell you though. You know, oh. I I collect them too, and what I do is I cut and paste them into a word document, and I, I mean, I just do this with all Beatles related articles every year. Um, it gives me a nice searchable document. And at this point, there's so much going on that I have it divided into quarterly files because they just get too big as Word documents. Mm -hmm. So since April, and this includes things that have been published about the Beatles individually and some other things, but it's mostly is Sgt. Pepper stuff. And since April 1st, so the announcement of this set was like April 4th or 5th, since April 1st, I've got some, a file that's something like 400 pages long with Pepper articles wow. mostly. You know, wow. Rolling Stone is doing a track by track, which, I mean, some of those I thought were, were quite good. You know, they've got a lot of information. Haven't run into too much I didn't know before, apart from what Melanie Co. is doing now. Melanie Co. <laughs> is you. You both know, yeah. maybe some of our readers don't, is the um, – girl who ran away from home and she's leaving home who the Beatles had actually met uh, it turns That's out right. a couple of times when she was on ready steady go in a in a dance a miming contest uh, and she won um, mm -hmm. and then it turned out to be the same girl I don't think they knew it at the time but anyway they they tracked her down and they talked to her and that was interesting and I think uh, ultimate classic rock magazine rock. Is, is yeah is doing uh is doing a track by track too. That's it's you know different person doing it. So mm -hmm. lot a lot of interesting stuff out there. I gotta tell you, I'm just completely consumed with it, and I've been loving every minute of it because Sgt. Pepper. You can look at that album from so many angles. You can write about that album, whether it's their greatest album. Why is it so important? Is it really better than Revolver? Or is Revolver really their best? Was it the Beatles at their peak? You can go on and on. It's so many different topics when it comes to Sgt. Pepper. And I, I love, you know, the, the good and the bad reviews. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's just a lot of fun. The fact that one album can generate so much interest that you can look at it from so many different angles. Yep. And, uh, you know, and I, I collected many of them on my website if you want to check out the important links page on my website. There was even one article where the writer thought that Sgt. Pepper possibly could have been the Beatles' worst album mm -hmm. because he felt that he was basically a rock and roller, this writer. He loved the early stuff, the simple stuff. Yeah. Play roll over Beethoven. That's rock and roll. Sgt. Pepper is not rock and roll. What are the Beatles doing talking about a circus in one song here? And Indian music with this spirituality here and uh, a dance hall song like When I'm 64. You know, to some people, that's not rock and roll. She's Leaving Home, beautiful classical elements in, in She's Leaving Home, mm -hmm. which they'd already done already, you know, with Yesterday and Eleanor Rigby. But to some people, this was artistically on such a higher level that they couldn't relate to it. You know? Well, that was basically the same argument that Richard Goldstein made when he wrote a negative review of the album for The Times in 1967, that it wasn't rock and roll and he thought it was a little pretentious. Uh, this is to sort of limit a group like the Beatles to say, you must do rock and roll and only rock and roll. And, you know, anything else that you might want to do that 
might elevate your music, might elevate the form, might redefine the form. No, that's verboten. You know, you must hmm. use a one four five chord progression. Anything other than that will result in a fine, <laughs> you know, and possibly <laughs> possibly jail time. <laughs> but yeah, hey, what can you say? It takes all kinds. Well, well mm-hmm. <laughs> for those of us who love the Beatles for so many reasons, one of the reasons why we love them is because they broke down the doors in every way. Mm-hmm. So Sergeant Pepper was, you know, one example of that. A very big example, too. Yeah. Let's talk about the book and what you guys thought about it. There's a lot of different chapters in there. Yep. I especially love the, the Kevin Howlett chapter where he goes song by song, the background, how the songs were, were written, and also how each song was recorded, and also pointing out the specific outtakes that are used in the box set. Right. You know, mm-hmm. I found, found that to be very helpful. Um, what were some of the highlights for you guys? How about you, Alan? A lot of highlights in this book. Um, For me, one of the highlights is the fact that handwritten manuscripts for every single song are included. Yeah, that was was beautiful. That was a thing to do. And in addition, um, some of the paperwork, some of the track sheets, some of uh, George Martin's notes about what's, you know, how thing, what speeds things are recorded at and, and stuff like that. Uh, mm. Letters from EMI uh, whining about the cost of the cover. Letters from the BBC saying that, you know, they had to ban a day in the life. So, I mean, really, I mean, just... It, it, even if you don't even read anything, which I don't recommend is the approach to take, uh, if you, even if you just look at the pictures, there's spectacular stuff in here, stuff that, mm-hmm. that we haven't seen before. But yeah, the, you know, the articles are great too. Um, I, you know, I kind of was a little surprised that for the studio uh, rundown that, that Mark Lewison didn't write it. I mean, I suppose he's not the only person on the planet who can – deal with the stuff, but he is sort of the name brand, you know, and we're talking about the Beatles and Sgt. Pepper and why not, you know, another name brand, you know. It right. could be I, I haven't asked him, you know, it could very well be that he's too consumed with volume two of the trilogy and in which case, you know, yeah, he should be because we want to have that out while we're still able to read. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but um yeah, you know, I mean, and Kevin Howlett, actually, it's interesting because he does challenge a couple of things from Mark's book, um, particularly Strawberry Fields um, and the keys that the various versions were recorded in. And, I mean, I guess the the biggest difference in his version, apart from what the keys actually are, is that we've always been told that One version was sped up, one version was slowed down, and they met in the middle. He says only that the orchestral version was slowed down. But he also puts it at a higher key than anybody had before, or puts the other at a lower key. Uh, I think he puts the take seven in the key of A, which I don't think anybody thought before. And one of the problems here is that these things were recorded on very speed, so that, you know, they might have recorded it. Uh, I think they explain in the book that 50 cycles per second is what it took for the machines to run at normal speed, and they could change the speed of the machine by by increasing or decreasing the number of cycles per second of electricity it was getting. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in some cases, they recorded things more slow, at a slower speed so that when you played it back at the normal 50 cycles a second, it would be faster and higher. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't know if we I, I don't know to what degree it really is documented what every single take was recorded at. I mean there there are some facsimiles of um tracking notes that actually do give the speed. So maybe he's right. Um maybe it's surmise. I, I'm not really sure. Interesting though. Yeah, I've always I've always been a little confused about strawberry fields in that regard because of the faster take, which to me just didn't even sound normal when you listen to it. I mean, I can't really believe that that John's voice sounds natural mm-hmm. in that fast speed. So maybe it all has to do with they really recorded it at a at a slower speed with the um, at normal speed with the tape slower, and then just sped the tape. 
Yeah, it could be anything. I mean, they they just this was this was the period this and Revolver where they just really liked messing around, you know, with with speeds. Hey, <laughs> they weren't going to have to play it live. They didn't have to think about what key it ended up in. They just had to think about whether they could sing it. And if they couldn't sing it, they could play it at a lower. <laughs> they could vary speed it down, do the vocal, then speed it up. There were a lot of things they could do. Yeah, I wasn't aware that within you, without you, they that. Um they played around with the speed of George's vocal. Mm-hmm. They sped it up a little bit, which I hadn't realized. Lovely read I'd heard about. Because yeah. it was supposed to have gone up from, I think it was recorded in the key of E-flat, and it's somewhere between E-flat and E. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> there are musicians who study this stuff who know that it just they can't make it sound exactly yeah. like what the Beatles did. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm. There were also you know, the sort of sociological essays in here. You know, what the scene right. was like in Britain at the time um, and what the reception was, both in Britain and America, to this album. Right. You know, the London Underground, there's a whole chapter on that. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think they, generally speaking, got good people to write those things. I'm just sort of paging through, looking for the bylines. But um, I like Jeff Slate's article at the right. end of the book. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. All about the Beatles in America, how the album was received here, and going back to what we always talk about when Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields, the videos were shown on American Bandstand. Yep. Yeah. So it's, it's just it's, so amazing just to think about how much happened in that in that period of time. You know, I was just thinking because when I was when I watched the Eight Days a Week documentary, and and I love the fact that they brought out. That in the very beginning of 1966, the Beatles took a break from being the Beatles for a few mm-hmm. months. Mm-hmm. They actually took a break from at the end of 66 mm-hmm. for a few months, mm-hmm. which, you know, because of the story of Sgt. Pepper, that's part of it right there, what they were doing right, right before recording Strawberry Fields, Penny Lane, and When I'm 64. Mm-hmm. That's one thing about this box set that I love is the two discs of outtakes presenting it in the order they recorded, recorded the songs. Right. It's so interesting to hear it in that order. It's kind of like, you know, you go through the Mark Lewison book. <laughs> you follow along with it. Right. The, the, the Beatles recording sessions. And uh, it's just fascinating that they started with The Day of the Life. Well, actually, when I'm 64, of all the songs that made it on the album. But something as adventurous yeah. as The Day of the Life was so early in the process. Just like Tomorrow Never Knows was the first song they worked on in Revolver. It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. Yeah. Fascinating stuff to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's another reason that uh, I'm not sure that, that, that anyone consciously did this, but um, I suppose if you're what you say about following along in, in the Lewison book, maybe that's actually a good reason to have had someone else do it because everybody was going to do that anyway. You know, you, you had the mm-hmm. Lewison book there, you were going to page along, compare it with what Kevin Howlett wrote, Howlett wrote, and uh, it's the more the merrier. Yeah. It's just fascinating to me that fans could actually listen to the music that way, yeah. <laughs> in that order. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you're on the journey with them <laughs> mm-hmm. right. as they're making the album. So, yeah. Anything else about the book? No. Well, I know Steve has something important he wants to bring up. Steve. Um, Rolling Stone has an article that says Sheila E is doing a new political covers LP, and I haven't really had time to scan this. To it, it, it's a, a tribute for Prince. Uh, and it also is um, referring back to the 2016 election. But Ringo is going to be a part of it, and he's going to – she's doing Come Together, and Ringo will be on that track. Mm-hmm. And, Very nice. And I'm trying to look here to see when this I, – I don't see a, a release date for it. I'm, like I said, I'm scanning through this article very quickly because I had not seen it before. But, um, yeah, it doesn't – I don't see a, a release date. But it also has – uh, Freddie Stone, um, uh, Israel Houghton, Candy Duffler, and she's going to do a bunch of different songs. Everyday People, One Nation Under a Groove, America, uh, a James Brown medley, What the World Needs Now, Respect Yourself, Blackbird, which there's that, that would make a second Beatles song, actually. So there, that's still interesting. That's still look forward to. Okay. And Sheila E. is also going to be on Ringo's next album. Yep. Yeah, we haven't heard the details on that yet, uh, how much uh, she's involved with that. I sure as hell would love to see her back with him. 
but I guess that's probably not going to happen. But she was so good when that uh, when she was on those tours with him. She mm-hmm. was just great. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know what else? When they did a Love Bazaar, which was one of the two Sheila E songs that that they performed in mm-hmm. the All Stars, Ringo actually did a drum solo mm-hmm. when they toured, and that's something that you never expect from Ringo. Right. He always says he doesn't like solos. And when the DVD came out for that tour, it wasn't on there. Huh. The song <laughs> wasn't on there. And I was looking for it so much. <laughs> you never see Ringo do a solo. But he actually went a little wild, you know, on, on the drums doing a solo. Because you know, I've seen all of his tours. And I do remember him doing that for a Love <laughs> Bazaar. So <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yep. She just really charged those those bands up that she was with uh, the all-star bands uh oh she knows? brought a lot of energy a lot she of did energy. yeah maybe maybe she'll come back i hope so well we will see all right this has been a great show here and uh if any of you would like to get in touch with us there is any number of ways you could do so and steve why don't you give contact information for yourself first well, you can get a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I'm on Facebook uh, on my own page, and I have a Beatles News and Information uh, group on Facebook and on Yahoo groups that I send out uh, things to uh, regularly. So you can get a hold of me there. Go ahead, uh, and you can get a hold of the show at Things We Said Today, radio show at gmail.com. We have a Facebook page called Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. We have a, a Twitter account, Things We Said Fab. And we're on Podbean. You can you can actually contact us through there. You can find the show on Podbean, on YouTube, on TuneIn. We're iTunes. iTunes. Yep. We're, we're all over the place. Okay. It's all over the place. Hmm. Yep. Alan? How about you? Um, well, you know, you can write to me through the group email. I read those. Um, or on Facebook at Cozen and uh, Alan Cozen and Alan Cozen Remixed. And if any listeners are in Portland, Maine, on Thursday, June 1st, the 50th a- actual anniversary of Sgt. Pepper, uh, there is a program at the uh, Maine College of Art uh, right downtown uh, with a panel discussion that I'm going to be on and some local musicians and newscasters and uh, production guys and it should be good. We're going to have a a discussion uh, first about Pepper and then we're going to listen to the 5.1 mix in a state-of-the-art studio on a, you know, really good speakers and everything. I've heard it before. And um, so if you're around, uh, it's free and uh, pop by. And say hello. Okay. You also have that event at the Paley Center. On June that you might 6th. want to talk about. Yeah, on June 6th at the Paley Center. It's a, a program about the Summer of Love. And uh, obviously the Beatles sort of play into that. It's going to be uh, – I'm on a panel with uh, Michelle Phillips, Graham Nash, Kenny Loggins, and um, D.A. Pennebaker. And we're going to sort of talk about the summer of 67 and uh, from all those different points of view. So that should be fun. That's in New York City. Okay. A couple of opportunities to see Alan in action (laughs) right there. And as for me, Ken Michaels, you can email me at everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. I just want to say that now on my Beatles trivia and games page, I am giving away the new CD for Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band with the new 2017 stereo mix. And that's courtesy of Universal Music. And... Either sometime between June 1st and the 3rd, I'm starting a brand new special contest, kind of different. I'm giving away three prizes, and it's all on vinyl. It's going to be the new Sgt. Pepper with the uh, bonus disc in there of the the bonus tracks, the, um, the outtakes, as they appeared on the album in sequence. And then there's also Flowers in the Dirt with the bonus uh, vinyl disc of... The demos of Paul with Elvis Costello, the acoustic demos. And then I've also got George Harrison's Live in Japan to give away on vinyl. They're all courtesy of Universal Music. They're all double LPs. 
And to find out how to win, just go right to the website. There'll be a link right on my homepage, which will lead you to my special contest page. And again, that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. All right. So again, don't forget about the Sgt. Pepper special on PBS this coming Saturday. Check your local listings for that. It might be airing at 8 p.m. Could be at a different time. So for Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen, I'm Ken Michael saying thanks so much for listening. And we will see you next time. <laughs>